Before I get started with the first topic of this video, I do want to point out that the perspective that you're getting here is the perspective of a guy who hasn't watched more than a handful of Ring of Honor matches over the past six months or so. Not because of anything Ring of Honor did, it's just a case of my interests changing in a big way, as you can tell over my last few months worth of videos. Um, you know, it happens. But I want to talk about this match because when talking about Final Battle 2010, Ring of Honor made what was, from my perspective, the most important decision they could make for that show. And that was putting Steven Generico on last. To me, that's not simply a matter of preference, that's a very important decision that they made. And, you know, realistically, it probably wasn't that hard of a decision once they decided that Roger was going to retain, for whatever reason. But even if they were going to have Davey win, I would still have said, have Steven Generico go on last. Because... This is a feud that needed the big, dramatic, memorable conclusion on a big show to secure the place in Ring of Honor history that it so well deserved. You had the first encounter at Death Before Dishonor 8 and people were excited, not just because of the match quality, but because the feud atmosphere was there, um, the interactions were hot at the time between the two guys, you know, that was a great feeling that you know no, no great match could achieve on its own. Um, then you had Steven, Steven Carino versus Cabana and Generico at Glory Banner 9, and the match quality was still there, but was the feud atmosphere still as strong? That's the question, and we can debate over that, whether the feud was still hot during, I would say, the third quarter of this year. But let's work under the assumption that it was losing some of its fire. It needed that main event spot on a big show for the conclusion, and if the finale delivers as it did, then history forgets that there was ever a down point in the story at all. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with that at all. I think, I think that's the way that the entertainment industry works as a whole, not just wrestling. So, that's, that is everything I would have said before Final Battle if I had the time to do that video. I just didn't have the time to do the video because it was my, la it was my last week of college last week. Um, as far as Final Battle itself is concerned, I'm not going to go over the whole show. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to dwell on the world title match either because I think my tastes have passed a match like that by in a way. You know, I, t to me the match, the match was very template. Um, it had a story to begin with when Roddy was doing everything he could to cut off Davies' regular lines of offense, and that was going really well up until, for whatever reason, they gave, on that, gave up on that far too quickly. You know, you had Davies dive, then you had the excellent shooting star press spot, and after that, I wasn't really interested that much. You know, not a great match at all as far as I'm concerned, but don't pay much attention to me. I, I think I've, um, my tastes have passed that match by, so I wasn't going into it expecting anything spectacular. Um, you can probably see I wasn't willing to give the match a chance at all, and maybe to a degree that's right, but I don't think I'm completely immune to indie epics, as I might call them. You know, I just recently saw Hero vs. Tozawa from PWG's Bowling Night 2, and I thought that was... I'm going to talk about that match in my Top 25 Matches of the Year video, because there's a lot of things that match did that it did very, very well, and I want to talk about it. But this match, I didn't. I thought was too template for me to really enjoy it that much. Um, but getting on to the fight without honor... This was something that I was very, very interested in, because both of these guys would make a top 10 of my favorite indie workers on the current scene if I were to do that. And I think the crowd for this one, subject to my own sound quality for while watching this, I thought the crowd were good at some things, not so good at other things. You know, they were good for chants and not so good for loud cheers or boos when they were needed, um, especially. You know, the crowd did have one shining moment, and I'm going to talk about that later. But getting into the match... Um, Steen was, I say, fairly adequate at playing the domineering heel in the early going. He has the size and the character to, to pull that off, even though he's not the best at that I've ever seen. Um, this was a, that was a fine way to make up the first part of the match. I, I really did like the fact that some of the more brutal spots of the match were done to help Generico make a believable comeback. You know, and then you had Carino come out looking all like this big, big this, this, uh, this businessman who only cared about results and, you know, more level-headed than Steen. And Cabana came out appropriately serious and thankfully did not turn. I did not think that was necessary. And I'd say my favorite moment in the match was the aftermath of Steen's third package pile driver on Generico. You know, Steen stands up in total shock and the fans in their shining moments start shining ole, ole, ole. You know, very helpful to Steen's growing insanity. Um, the crowd also gave the ending the reaction it deserved and the right man went over so all i can say to those two guys is congratulations you did it you took us on a year-long journey that should remind everyone why it is so important to ha tell a story in the ring um it's not my, it's not my match of the year 
to me, it's not even top 10 of the year, but it's definitely worth checking out. It's definitely um, in my top 25, maybe in my top 15, maybe. I have to, you know, check that out, but definitely well, well worth checking out. Um, four and a half stars. Fantastic match, appropriate to the feud, and like I said, check it out if you have not done so already. So that's that. Just a quick little um, show of praise to a match that I was looking forward to and delivered on all counts. Um, let's move on. Let's talk about Dragon Gate, both in Japan and in the US. Starting with a review of Dragon Gate's latest pay-per-view, The Gate of Destiny 2010, which took place October, not October, November 23rd. I was in the mood to watch this show because it feels like forever since I watched a Dragon Gate pay-per-view. You know, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first pay-per-view since the Kobe Festival. I might be wrong about that. And, and to be honest, I don't really watch the Infinities unless I hear that there was a great match on one of the episodes. But I do like watching the pay-per-views because they're fun shows. I always think they're fun shows. You know, Dragon Gate has have a great presentation, the video packages, the music, and they have a loyal fan base that are always into everything that's going on. You know, I think the shows are a great spectacle. They're always great spectacles, even though the wrestling might not always be the best. And that's definitely the case with this show, because, you know, this was definitely the weakest Dragon Gate pay-per-view I've seen this year. I've not seen Dead or Alive, and I probably will not watch it, to be honest. But I think Compilation Kit and the Kobe Festival were both much better than this. Um, but, you know, let's get into the show. We started off with a six-person tag team match. Ryo Saito, Genki Horiguchi, and Nozawa Rongai versus BB Hulk, Anthony W. Mori, and Super Shiza. This was, you know, what can I say, a serviceable opener, two and a half stars. Really nothing more than just some average, mildly enjoyable Lucha Rest action. So, not bad at all, not really much to say. Let's move on quickly to um, Hollywood stalker Ichikawa versus a mystery opponent that turned out to be Riki Choshu, um, the aged legend of the Japanese wrestling world who went out there and squashed Ichikawa in like 30 seconds. It's okay though because the fans still love Choshu and there's something about the way Ichikawa dresses that makes him that makes you think, yeah, he had that coming to him. So it was somewhat fun, although it is way too early for some light comic relief on this show, I will say that. This little segment would have done a lot better in between two of the 30 minute matches later on. Just saying, um, I'll be talking more about the length of these matches a little bit later on, but this would have been much better placed um, later on in the show. We move on to a singles match, um, Kezi versus Kagetora. This was okay. You know, you got the sense that Kezi was trying, was really into what he was doing and was trying really hard, but he's not really that impressive, so his efforts don't really lead to much of a match. It's about the only notable thing you can say about this one, though, so I would say two and a quarter stars. You know, you got a, a good sense of Kezi that he was trying hard. I guess effort will lead to that rating, even though the match itself, probably the weakest match on the show, I would say. Um, not really much to talk about there. And then we move on to the first of four title matches on this show, starting with the Open the Brave Gate Championship match. Pac defending against Dragon Kid. Um, the next four matches got, get a lot of time. None of, the, none of them needed as much time as they got, but this match probably made the most out of the time that it got, had the best use of the time that it got. You know, these two seemed like they were going for concussions at first, actually. You know, Dragon Kid came out with a sick-looking Hurricane Ranas for that effect, and that was probably the most interesting spot on the whole show, to be honest. Um, but Park wasn't really in peril long enough, and then he, when he was starting to target um, Dragon Kid's head, that didn't last too long either. So, you know, the limb work was kind of abandoned really early on. It pretty much turned into this big back-and-forth battle, but it was a good... Big, it was a good back and forth battle, so you know, don't get me wrong, it was still a good back and forth battle. You know, no overkill, no over ambitious 2.9 counts, and when Pac hit his finisher, that was it. 1, 2, 3, over. Not too bad. Um, still went too long though, because they were holding themselves to a pretty good standard throughout, but they weren't progressing in quality as they were going longer, so it didn't need to go as long as it did. Uh, it was still a very good match, so I would say 3.5 stars for that one. Um, not too bad. We move on to the Open the Twin Gate Championship match, which was um, Kunis, I believe, versus Susumu, no, not versus, Kunis and Susumu Yokozuka versus Naruki Doi and Gamma. Um, being up front, for a title match on a pay-per-view, this was a poor match, being bluntly honest about it. You know, um, spoiler alert, but I believe this was Doi's first pay-per-view appearance since he turned heel, and I got little to no heel characteristics from him whatsoever. 
Um, if anything, he was the least impressive guy in this match, actually. You know, Gamma was a good heel. Um, Kunis was an adequate baby face in peril, even though the mask blocks his facial expressions completely. And Yokozuka was an okay face as well. But there was absolutely nothing worthwhile to get out of any anything they did here. You know, no drama, no suspense, no memorable moments. And this was a title, this was a match with a title change. So that's definitely not good. You know, and for a 25 minute match. It's all around bad, I'd say. Yeah, bad match. No way around it. You know, I don't want to spend any more time on this because I just did not like this match at all. Two and three quarter stars. Um, I'm sure people will be less harsh on it than I was, but I just did not like this match at all. Um, for Doi's first appearance on pay-per-view as a heel, I thought he really under under um, undersold himself. I'll just say that. Um, so... Probably the biggest disappointment on the show, even though I still watch the shows for just a general fun. If I was watching the shows for matches to deliver, you know, I'm only really fans of three guys in Dragon Gate, and those would be Shingo, BB Hulk, and Yamato. If, you know, so really when I watch Dragon Gate pay per view, I'm really looking for just a fun time, but a match like that I do think should have been, you know, at least good, and that wasn't even a good match. It was just a an average match, and for a title match on pay per view, that was just poor, so. I would say that. I'm wasting too much time on that match. Let's move on to the Open the Triangle Gate Championship match. Um, Takuya Sugawara, Naoki Tanazaki, and Yasushi Kanda defending against Mizaki Mochizuki, Don Fuji, and, Genik and Kenichiro Arai, and also defending against Yamato, Shingo Takagi, and Cyber Kong. I was interested in this because I can only imagine how hard it must be, how much of a challenge it must be to put together a match with nine people in it, you know, but I thought Dragon Gate could rise to that challenge, you know, they could put together something worth watching, that's kind of what they are, should, they should be good at by all accounts, and you know, let's be honest with ourselves, if they had managed to give a meaningful role to all nine guys, it would have deserved a perfect score, you know, it definitely wasn't that good, so I think I had realistic expectations going into this, and, you know, on some level they were met, but, dear lord, you know, if there was any match on this show that would have been great with a lot less time, this was that match. You know, the, the previous match would have been bad, whether or not it was 25 minutes or 15 minutes, and the other two matches would have been better if they were shorter, but not great matches. This could have been a great match if it were shorter, but it was too damn long. You know, there was a lot of outside brawling at the start, which Dragon Gate can sometimes do quite well. But in this case, it did not come up very well at all, you know. There was one sequence where you had Fuji and Yamato up on the balcony, and Fuji was able to steer Yamato the distance of an entire row of seats with just chops. You know, to me, it came up very cheesy. And, you know, the middle portion of this match, though, I think was my favorite part on the whole show. You know, they picked a few guys that they wanted to highlight, and they ran with it, you know. Fuji looked good, Cyber Kong looked good, and I believe it was... Arai as well, who came off with some very good stuff as well. You know, the match still needed more Yamato, and it definitely needed a lot more Shingo, you know. Um, the tandem spot with all nine guys, I think there were two of those. Um, the first one I'm pretty sure we've seen before. The second one I don't believe I've ever seen before, so I was kind of, I was enjoying that. And they did, they did come out with some creative team interactions. So, you know, it was going along very, very well um, in the middle portion. Then you had the first team get eliminated, and somehow, you know, the absence of three guys, you would think that they would get even better, but somehow they just kind of kind of fell apart after the first elimination. So, you know, the good stuff in this match was very good, but there was too much filler. You shortened this match down to 20 minutes, and you have a great match, but you went 30 minutes, so you have a three and a half star, just a very good match. Um, so... Again, too, far too much time given to this one. Um, it could have been a lot better. It was still very good, though, and it still had some very, very cool stuff in it. So I would definitely say still check it out. And if you can wade through the bullshit, you'll, you'll see some really good stuff um, before it's all over. So um, not too many complaints about that. Um, we move on to the main event, which was the Open the Dream Gate Championship match between Masato Yoshino and Shima. I'm not allergic to Dragon Gate epics, I guess you can call them, but there have been a few this year that I've really bought into, such as, you know, Doi and Yamato would be one of them, Shingo vs. Hulk would be another. This match, though, lacked the emotion of both those matches, and even among spots, I didn't really see a lot of impressive stuff here. You know, another 30 minute match that did not need to go that long, and it did, however, I will give it credit for this, it did, however, show some progression with the moves they, they were doing. You know, both guys did their signature moves from the top turn buckle after they had done those moves just on the mat and they had failed to get more than a two count. You know, when Shima did that, Yoshino sold it absolutely beautifully, I thought. You know, so a credit goes to him for that. 
And when Yoshino did it, um, he had the match won with another submission. So I will reward it for consistency, uh, even though I don't think the match as a whole was anything special. You know, much like the entire show. If you're in the mood for a Dragon Gate show like I was, you'll probably still enjoy it. I certainly still did, still did enjoy it. Um, but it's not really recommended, you know. It's not a waste of your time either, but it really just depends on your mood for this sort of thing. So that's what I would say for that pay-per-view. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about in this video is Dragon Gate USA. Um, for those of you that may not be aware, there's an article posted on the website talking about business changes for 2011 to try and grow the brand. Um, first of all, I quite like the transparency shown between fan and promoter by posting the article to begin with. And it does have a lot of interesting things to say, and a lot of what it says makes sense. Um, you know, deciding which American indie is second to Ring of Honor isn't really that easy. Chikara are really a competitive brand per se, but the biggest advantage that they have is they have a core group of guys that can go all around, can travel all around to different places, and people still associate them with Chikara. You know, they have such a family atmosphere that I don't think they'll go down really that easily. You know, um, they're such a tight knit group that they won't go out of business all that easily. I think they'll hang on for a long time. Um, and PWG has had a string of bad luck this year because even though it's absolutely not their fault, the failure of Kenny Omega and Davey Richards to commit to the company makes it look second rate. It just does. Um, it's not their fault at all because you know you can take it for you can take it for granted that if Davey were, were Ring of Honor champion and New Japan called him up and said we want you on full time, he'd go without hesitation. You know that's just the, that's just the nature of making a living. Um, PWG was just the victim of bad luck. But to me, it's made the product so centralized that it's now below Chikara and Dragon Gate USA. You know, not just that, but, you know, Chikara and Dragon Gate USA, they travel around a lot. PWG really doesn't. And plus, to me, this is just a little thing, but to me, PWG has the presentation of a generic no-name indie. You know, Chikara, all they do is put a bunch of banners around the you know the venue that they're at but it does make it look a little at least a little bit personalized you know pwg doesn't do that at all you know which that, that's such an easy thing to fix i don't know why they do it um they don't do it so that's just a little um personal gripe i have with them but you know to me you can bracket chikara and dragon get usa at about the same level below ring of honor and as much as i like chikara there's no reason why dragon get usa cannot eclipse Chikara completely in popularity because there are always going to be some people there's always going to be some people who can't overlook the Chikara atmosphere there's just, just a stereotype towards it um, if you read this article though they're changing a lot of things for the better and you know more shows faster DVD production yes um, more locations all good stuff you know one thing that needs to change though in my opinion is the balance of Japanese and American talent on the shows you know I wouldn't say that if they had at least one of what I might call the American prodigies. Um, on some level, you wonder what, whether the Japanese guys are really motivated about these American dates. The first shows were clearly a big deal, and that was reflected in their work. But things have mellowed out since then. You know, when, but they've mellowed out a lot since then. But when you get Brian Danielson versus Shingo, not that I know this myself, but it's easy to imagine that Shingo being impressed enough with Danielson to go out there and have a great match, you know. So I think Dragon Gate USA, ha it has to have a guy like that, you know. It wouldn't matter that much if they had a guy like that, but finding a guy like that is the problem, you know. Davey, Dragon, Nigel, Joe, they're all contracted elsewhere, and I can't think of anyone else off the top of my head that has that prodigy feel to them, you know. In the absence of that, you need to build up your own guys. You have guys like Gargano and Moxley, two guys that can and will improve and will definitely improve a lot bit more if you send them to Japan and if you keep using them on Evolve. But while they're developing and while you're scouting other talent, which you seem to be doing pretty well, you need to grow the brand with the Dragon Gate talent that you have to get more eyes on the talent that you're developing. You know, I dare say you can still use the Chikara guys because you know, in big roles, because, you know, guys like Quackenbush, Jigsaw, and Hollow Wicked are, like, indie veterans at this stage in their careers, but I don't know what I don't know what it is that motivates the Japanese guys to have a great match. The first step would be to get the title off BB Hulk and get it on someone like Shingo, and then bring in more guys from Japan. You know, you're, you're adding in Pac, that's a good thing. I, will, I hope we hear about more signings soon, because they're having, actually, more articles, articles about this subject in the future, you know? Um... Because, you know, make no mistake about it, if, you know, if Dragon Gate USA ever grows to the point where they're having as many shows as Ring of Honor, then of course you're going to have to de-emphasize the Japanese talent, because they're not going to be able to come to the States that often. But, 
you know, right now the ratio of Japanese to American talent to me is premature and overambitious. You know, while you're growing the brand, you need to have you need to emphasize the element of the show that makes you unique. And in this case, it's the fact that you have Dragon Gate guys and no one else does. So that's my little um, response to the Dragon Gate USA article. I'm all done for this video. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace.